Hello, this is PSMN 511, Pastoral Ministry, Week 8, from Bill Scheidler's Pastoral Ministry Student Guide and Teacher's Manual. This is Lessons 13 and 14 on Water Baptism and Communion. When we talk about water baptism and communion, we're talking about the sacraments of the church. These are two that are common throughout almost every Christian denomination. A sacrament um, really represents uh, a Christian rite recognized as having particular importance and significance in the life of the church and the believer. There are many views on the existence and meaning of such rites. Many Christians consider the sacraments to be a visible symbol of the reality of God as well as a channel for God's grace. Again, the Catholic Church and what is called high Protestant churches such as Lutheran or Presbyterian uh, differ from what's referred to as low Protestant, um, Evangelicals, Baptists, Pentecostals. And so each has a slightly different nuanced understanding of what a sacrament is. But again, especially with regard to water baptism and communion, almost every Christian church recognizes the significance of these sacraments in the life of the individual. Water baptism is a powerful visual symbol of a convert's confession of faith. The word baptize is from the Greek word uh, baptizo, which literally means I dip or I submerge, but specifically with respect to a ceremonial dipping, uh, meaning I baptize. Um, this was a practice that was not unique to the Christian church. Um, Gentiles who became um, proselytes of Judaism would be baptized. Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist, according to Jesus' own words, in order to fulfill all righteousness. And uh, in many respects, Jesus is symbolic of, of believers and is fulfilling uh, for us and as an example f for us to follow uh, that cleansing that comes really through his blood, symbolized through the water. The disciples baptized new converts, and on the day of Pentecost, Peter said that new believers should be baptized in the name of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There are some people who are called Unitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Churches, or UPC, that believe you should only baptize in the name of Jesus, and unless you're baptized in the name of Jesus only, sometimes they're called Jesus only, then you're not saved. Um, however, most churches, Trinitarian churches, simply use the words of Jesus himself, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Think about the pastor's role in baptizing new converts. This particular class is called pastoral ministry, and so it deals with the practical applications of exercising the pastoral role and responsibilities. And so this lesson is very practical with respect to water baptism. And so first of all, we think about the place of baptism, where someone will be baptized. I grew up in a country church, and we would go down to the creek. We would stand on the shore. The church would sing and we would be baptized in the creek. Of course, when it was cold out in the wintertime, we couldn't baptize, and so the people would wait until it was warm enough. But there must be an adequate amount of water to baptize if the practice of your church is to baptize by immersion. And uh, so some denominations uh, don't practice immersion. They sprinkle. The Catholic Church does and other uh, high Protestant churches uh, do pouring or sprinkling as an alternative to immersion. And uh, some might ask, you know, where did that come from in light of the fact that the word itself literally means to, to submerge? We know very early in the teaching of the church 
that this practice of pouring or sprinkling water was allowed when there was not sufficient amount of water available uh, to immerse a person. And in a very, in some of the areas where it was very arid, uh, desert areas, this, this could be a legitimate issue. So the Didache is the earliest Christian document in the genre of what's called church orders. Um, it's written as early, parts of it as early as A.D. 49, 50. That's as early as some of the earliest uh, writings in the New Testament. And uh, they believe some of this goes back actually to uh, have apostolic origins. Uh, the final, there's only one extant or complete manuscript that survived. And they believe it was probably completed, uh, the Didache itself, by 150 by AD 150 or, or earlier. So it was a very early document. What is the Didache? Well, the word Didache is from the Greek meaning the teaching. And it was the teachings of, of the church. It's divided into three sections. Number The first section dealt with Christian ethics, how Christians should behave and, and uh, the ethical behavior of believers. The second dealt with Christian rites and rituals, such as the sacraments and water baptism and communion. And the third part dealt with the church organization and structure. I bring this up because with respect to um, pouring or sprinkling as opposed to immersion, this actually is found very early in this document, the Didache indicates that the preference is for the convert to be immersed. But if there's not adequate water available, then the water could be poured upon the convert in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So even in this very early document, you have an indication of the Trinitarian, uh, as we call it, formula for baptism. And the preference is for living water. Uh, and by living water, it's referring to like a stream, a creek, a river. And uh, I think the video, I, um, there's a video at that link there. It's called reformedforum.org, Baptism in the Didache. And uh, for those who are from the Reformed tradition, and of course, Reformed University embraces this, there's some good instruction there at this particular site. Now, in that video, the teacher refers to the fact that the Didache referred to cold water, but actually a better translation would be living water or like a river or stream as opposed to just cold water. think about the pastor's role. You have to have adequate water. The water, this is common sense. Water should be clean and fresh, should be reasonable temperature, should be easily accessible, and it should be a place that's usable year-round. Our church has a baptismal. Uh, the way ours works, it accommodates one person who goes into the water, and the pastor stands on the outside, actually reaches over the side and does the water baptism. We have a heater, so the water's not exceptionally cold or hot. We try to get it at the right temperature, make sure that the water's clean. It's fresh water each time um, that we have a baptismal service, although we may have several people baptized in the same water. I was at a church in Washington, D.C., and we had a major baptism. We baptized over 30 people, and it was the exact same kind of baptism I have here, where only one person can go in at a time. And uh, honestly, the water was getting a little dirty uh, from from that many people being baptized, but nobody seemed to care. When you think about possible places for someone to be baptized, of course, a church baptistry is probably the best thing. I, I was pastor at a church in Kansas. They had no baptistry, and so I purchased a swimming pool uh, that was about th three feet deep, I think, and uh, we baptized about 20 people in the swimming pool. And the positive thing for my children was after the baptism, we kept the swimming pool. Uh, another thing, as I said, when I grew up was a natural water source, such as a, a creek, a river, a lake. Some people have used in prisons and, and um, in other settings, they used a large water trough, like they use a watering trough for cattle. And uh, they're larger 
than a bathtub and large enough for someone to be immersed in if that's the the mode of baptism that a particular denomination chooses. Again, if you're using pouring or sprinkling, uh, really these aren't issues that you have to worry about. Again, they talk about a large bathtub or a hot tub would work. And it should be accessible for members of the congregation to witness the baptism. This is a public confession of faith. And so there should be people there to actually see it, to witness it, and to celebrate with the new convert. Think about the spiritual or the preparation of the candidate here at my church. I have them come early during the Sunday school hour, and then I talk with them about the meaning and the significance of water baptism. And then I take them to see where they'll be baptized. I talk to them about the mechanics of going in to the baptismal, coming out, encourage them to use the handrail, um, and show them where they can change their clothes. So and my class is, in fact, about 45 minutes, but each church is different. Some churches have a catechism that may be several weeks leading up to the baptism. Um, just need to be aware of, of whatever organization you're credentialed with, what their uh, standards are and what their teaching is. And in the class, uh, we should uh, cover some of the following. First of all, you want to a list of the names for permanent record. It's good for the church to have a record of who's baptized. In fact, um, many years ago, uh, a baptism record could be a source of ID uh, early uh, back in the 1930s or even in the 40s. Sometimes children were born at home and their names may not be registered at the courthouse. And one of the things they would use as an ID when they went to uh, have a birth certificate made would be their baptismal record. I don't know how much that would be used now, but it's still good for a church to have a record of the candidates and the people, the converts who've been baptized. Again, you should begin with prayer in the class, thanking God for them and for their decision and for their faith. It's good to have each person share briefly, um, just answering some of these questions. When did you accept Jesus as your Savior? Why do you desire to be baptized today? And these are important. Um, some denominations, uh, the Church of Christ and the United Pentecostal Churches, um, some of them argue that you're not even saved until you're baptized. Uh, many others, most evangelical churches, would argue or would, their belief is that um, Baptism is for someone who has already given their heart to the Lord, and this is like a public confession of the faith that they've already put in the grace of God. Again, for this class, you want to share some basic teaching concerning baptism, include why we should be baptized and what to expect. And in, uh, in Scheidler's um, student guide, he has a extensive example of what his class and what his teaching covers. Uh, aim at inspiring faith um, to believe for a biblical experience. We don't want it just to be mechanical. There should be something weighty and significant about the experience. Should be The teaching should be simple and clear. You don't want to get too heavy into theology with a new convert at this point. But it should be clear to them that Jesus instructed us to do it, that Apostle Peter instructed the new believers to do it, and that it is a powerful um, symbol of, especially immersion, of one's death uh, to the old self and to sin and coming up out of the water as a resurrection unto new life. So immersion is a very powerful symbol of, of salvation should emphasize the truths found in Romans chapter 6, such as dying to sin, living for God. You want to ask them if they have any questions and uh, be prepared to, to answer them to, to the best of your ability. Um, Scheidler is apparently um, Pentecostal. And so he talks a lot about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that this is a great opportunity for someone. As Jesus was baptized, the Spirit came down upon him and remained with him. 
And he feels like this is a good opportunity for someone to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Again, if your particular denominations or your licensing agent uh, agency doesn't uh, believe in that, you certainly would not want to force anything that is inconsistent with your licensing agency. And you want to encourage the people to spend time in prayer prior to baptism. The Didache instructed candidates to fast and pray prior to baptism. In terms of just the, the logistical things, let them know how to dress. Um, it's important to understand when clothing gets wet, it can become see-through, which can be quite embarrassing. If your church has robes, that's good. Typically, we ask people to wear dark clothes um, because it doesn't show through as readily as, say, light clothing would. But let them know how to dress if you, and let them know if you have robes. Make sure they know to bring a change of clothes. Uh, show them where they'll get ready to change and um, encourage them to bring a towel as well but you might want to have some extra towels available in case they forget theirs we actually at one point we haven't done it lately we had towels embroidered with the church's name and so we would actually give that as a gift uh, when they were baptized and let them know what you'll be saying I, I always read the scripture from Matthew chapter 28, verse 9, where Jesus said, Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then uh, you want to join the candidates prior to baptism for prayer. Pray with them. Then you also want to speak to the congregation. Let them know who it is that's being baptized and give that person an opportunity to, for a short testimony, typically what I'll do is I'll just ask them, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And I give them the opportunity to say yes, and if they want to give a short testimony, they can. But it's important for the candidate to affirm that they have given their heart to the Lord and for the congregation to hear this and to understand this. Typically, you're going to have... Uh, you know, one candidate at a time in the baptismal area. If you're in a creek like we were, be the pastor. He would call out one candidate, and then that person would be baptized, and then they would call out the next one. Uh, where our baptismal is in the church, it will only actually accommodate one person at a time. Again, introduce the candidate. Give them a time to share. And then, of course, you baptize the candidate. If it's immersion to take them under the water and back up, help them back up. And if it's pouring, to again, to, to do that in the manner that is consistent with your church's teaching. And as, again, you may have your church, your denomination may have its own baptismal formula. Um, but you might say something like, upon confession of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Usually, I will say all of that prior to taking them under the water. I don't say it while they're under the water. I say it first. They go back and straight back up out of the water. You encourage the candidate in the congregation to worship the Lord. It's certainly a time to celebrate. Uh, water baptism is a powerful symbol of what has happened in a person's life and we ought to celebrate that with them it should be a big deal typically we encourage people to invite family and friends in some cases we have uh, we will send out invitations on behalf of the candidate from the church inviting them to this event it's a good opportunity to evangelize and then before you dismiss candidates you want to pray uh, with them and encourage them to grow in grace and in faith. This isn't the end of a journey. It's really part of the beginning, the initial steps of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, with respect to children, again, your particular denomination may have its own uh, rules or policies 
or doctrines concerning children. Um, in in a, most evangelical churches, if a church if a child is old enough to articulate their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, you know we just follow the uh, admonition of Jesus to suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. So in our group, we would not baptize infants, but we would baptize children. Some groups will water baptize by sprinkling or pouring infants. Um, other groups will not baptize a child that's younger than 13. And I had actually some people in uh, in my church once where I baptized a, ch a child that was, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. But they expressed that they had asked Jesus to come into their heart to forgive them of their sins. And they wanted to be baptized. And so we did it. But these people came from a culture from another country, actually, where they did not baptize children younger than 13. And so they were offended. And, uh, you know, you're just going to have to make a decision about that and make it clear to the church what, what your teachings are and why. In terms of the atmosphere, you want the witness of the congregation, music, prayer, praise. Again, it's a time of celebration. The worship leader should lead the congregation in worship. Uh, perhaps when the congregate comes out of the water, maybe a song if you have more than one between each one. And again, in terms of the class, what a class might look like for water baptism, uh, Bill Scheidler has an example of the one that they use at his church. And you might want to refer to that and maybe structure something similar to that. Uh, or again, always consult with your own denominational uh, teachings and doctrines. Another significant sacrament is communion. Communion is also called the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, which means giving thanks, the table of the Lord, breaking bread, sacrament. The elements of communion are variously called bread and wine, the body and the blood of Christ. Um, we, in, in my denomination, we never used real wine. We always used grape juice. In fact, in the uh, accounts of, of, the, of the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, they never used the word wine. They talk about the cup. Uh, most people understand that it was wine. But, um, I mean, technically it never actually calls it wine. But um, some churches, they use uh, real wine. We actually, at one point, we use these pre-sealed um, cups, communion cups. So you have the cup with the wine, and then sealed over it is the wafer. And so you hand those out. And uh, at one point, we were going to have communion, and we had not purchased fresh wine. And we had these self-contained uh, cups with the wafers. And uh, they had actually expired, but from what I understood, they were pasteurized and they were sealed. So we used them, and immediately when I drank mine, I realized that the grape juice had actually fermented. And I could tell by the looks on different people's faces that they realized that as well. But nobody complained. Nobody got upset. It was just uh, kind of a fluke accident. There are three views of the elements uh, the, the bread and the cup. The Catholic Church teaches something called transubstantiation. They believe that, um, that supernaturally, or I don't, that's really not the word I want to use, but they believe that the bread and the and the wine become literally the blood and the and the body of Jesus. This is the body, Jesus said, which is uh, which is broken for you, and this is my blood uh, in the new covenant. Uh, other churches, other than Catholics, have moved away from that. The high Protestants, such as Lutherans and um, Episcopalians, uh, believe in something called uh, consubstantiation, which means that it is the body and blood of Jesus, but at the same time, it is still bread and wine. So they don't believe it literally becomes it, but they believe that there is that it is the body and the blood while still remaining the bread and the cup. And they use the analogy of Jesus' incarnation. He was both God and man at the same time. Uh, most evangelicals in what's called low Protestant churches 
view the communion as a memorial when Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me till I come. And so they believe each time we do this, it powerfully reminds us of the sacrifice that was given for our salvation. I want to lay the right foundation for communion so people understand the significance of it. You can do that, of course, uh, briefly each time, but on an ongoing basis in classes, Sunday school classes, Bible studies, maybe a sermon occasionally that deals with it, uh, regular teaching on communion and, and the significance of it. Um, and you want to have frequent exhortations. So when we take the, the bread, or in, in our case, a wafer, uh, unleavened bread. We talk about it representing the body of Jesus, and we talk about he was uh, bruised for our iniquities, and, and we talk about by his stripes we were healed. Um, you also want to have the attendants. If you pass these elements out, you want to have them prepared. I knew a church in, uh, I think it was Lexington, Kentucky, a church of 20,000, and they had communion every Sunday. And now we do it quarterly, so every three months, first Sunday of the month, we will have a communion service. This church of 20,000 did it every Sunday, and I was talking to some of their members, and I was like, how do you do that logistically? And they had on the backs of their pews those little uh, cup holders, and so they used those prepackaged uh, cups with wafers that I talked about. And so at a point in the service, the uh, pastor would pause and say, at this time, we're going to observe communion. And... Um, and he would, you know, talk them through it. It probably took maybe 10 minutes of the service. And then they would put the used cup and, you know, push the paper back into the cup and set it back into that little holder in the pew. And they had multiple services. So they had ushers that were just had practice doing this. And they would go through and they would take out the uh, used cups and put in the new and uh, turn over the service in just a matter of minutes. So they were... Um, quite uh, experienced in doing it that way, but different churches have different um, frequencies. The Bible really doesn't tell us how often. He just said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. But you need to have the attendance prepared if you pass it out in the communion trays, as we do sometimes. Other times we put it uh, at the front of the church uh, on a table, a communion table, and the people actually come up and take it themselves, and then they will stand there at the altar and will partake together. You want to give guidance on who's invited to participate. There's two different views. One's called open communion. The other's closed communion. Open communion, such as we have, would be we would allow anybody who um, has confessed faith in Jesus Christ, and we you know, we have to take them at their word when they do that uh, to participate in the communion service. Other churches will only allow their members, their own members, to participate in the communion service. So again, you want to refer to your own denominational guidelines. Um, distribution of the elements should be made while there's a, perhaps reading of relevant scripture, music's played, uh, uh, for example, by an ensemble, uh, maybe a congregational song, or perhaps an instrumental. But some kind of background um, music or prayer or scripture reading while it's being handed out so you don't just have uh, just dead air. Although some people, uh, some denominations, uh, like that silence. So there are some groups that prefer the silence. But typically in evangelical churches, we're going to have some music playing while the elements are distributed. Prayer should be offered as blessing over each of the elements. So uh, typically I would read the verse of scripture, usually from Corinthians where Paul writes about it. And we read about the, the bread and then we partake together and pray. And then we read about the cup and then we partake and pray. The congregation should partake together following Jesus' pattern of the bread first and the cup second. And communion should be followed by another song or congregation of worship, again, depending upon your own tradition. And then the cups, if you don't have the, the receptacle in the backs of the pews, 
um, we have uh, small uh, waste baskets that are passed down the rows uh, of pews for people to um, collect those in. Unfortunately, grape juice stains uh, bad. We have light carpeting and pews, and inevitably someone is spilling it. And so it's just one of the hazards, I guess, of, of having it that way. But um, it is what it is. You have to just do what's going to work best for your particular setting. As I said, we've used a couple different ways. We often we have our attendants ready, and we've worked through this over the years to try to do it as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Again, sometimes we have the believers come forward and take the the cup and the bread from the trays uh, on, a, on a communion table at the front of the church, and then we stand together at the altars and partake together. And as I mentioned already, there's also the option of the pre-sealed elements that would be actually in the pews if you have pews that have those uh, communion cup holders. Another thing that uh, has come up lately, so with the COVID, we had people at home, we have people watching online. So what I do the week before is I inform the, the people who may be watching online that we will be observing communion in the next service. And I encourage them to have already available uh, some unleavened bread, such as uh, uh, crackers or something like that, and some uh, grape juice prepared so that when we partake, they can partake with us. So they can do that from home. You can also get little like travel communion kits to take to the hospital or to shut-ins at home or nursing homes and observe the communion with members in that fashion as well. Scheidler gives some specific examples from his church, City Life Church. You need to make sure people know the time of the service. You want to let them know ahead of time that you're going to be having it. Um, uh, the exhortation in terms of uh, how you're going to, uh, to to share with people the meaning of it. You want to have all that prepared uh, in the partaking. Again, starting with the bread, proceeding to the cup, and then con a concluding prayer and um, and receiving the used cups. Again, there's a lesson on communion by Bill Scheidler. Uh, in there as an example of what they do at his church, and you can refer to that as well. But as always, refer to your own denominational doctrines and teachings on these things. These are some practical things that pastors need to be aware of and prepared for when they are um, helping their congregants observe these sacraments of water baptism and communion. These are significant things in the life of the church and should be significant in the life of individual members. And so a pastor should should uh, put emphasis on it and, and give it a sense of importance uh, when participating on these with his members.